Welcome to A Walk in the Garden. I'm Liz Davey, and you're watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV Norfolk Community Cable Television. I'm here in my herb garden, and things are winding down. Uh, we're getting ready for a frost that hasn't occurred yet, but we're down to the end of September, so we know it's going to be coming soon. And we're starting some preparations for fall and for the coming winter, but we're still enjoying some very nice weather and today it's almost 90 degrees. However, that's going to slip into the 60s by two days from now. So the weather tends to fluctuate quite a bit in the spring and fall, and uh, this is one of them. So far, we have escaped even a touch of frost, but we know it's coming. Today, I'm going to be planting some bulbs, and the bulbs I'm going to plant are saffron crocus. Saffron is probably the herb or spice that is the most expensive of any spice in the world. In fact, it's per pound more expensive than gold. Fortunately, if you like saffron, and it's used in a number of recipes, uh, it gives a bright golden color and a distinct flavor. It's used in savory and sweet dishes. If you like it, you can grow your own. It comes from a crocus, and it is the stigma of the crocus that you pick and the crocus actually blooms in the fall. There are other fall blooming crocuses, however, they are not producers of saffron, only one particular type of crocus. The others are somewhat toxic, so you want to make sure you have the actual saffron crocus bulbs. I've planted it before, and I've always had trouble with the uh, chipmunks and the voles and the mice digging it up. So this year I thought I would get a little smarter and try putting it in a little hardware cloth cage. I made this with a pair of uh, tin snips and some hardware cloth and just folded a piece into a little cage. And I put five saffron crocus bulbs in it. And what I'm gonna do is bury those so that the tops of the bulbs are four to six inches deep. And I've already dug the hole here. So we'll just plunk it down in. Uh, again, these are the earliest bulbs to be planted. Any of the fall blooming crocuses, and we'll look at one of the fall blooming crocuses in bloom, not a saffron crocus, but an actual uh, ornamental one, a little later. They all get planted very early so that they can make their uh, root growth. So I'm just going to bury these and put dirt over them. I'm also going to be mulching this well and folding it down well. They aren't very tall, so I thought an area that's kind of in the front of one of the beds would be best for them. This will put up foliage in the spring, the typical crocus foliage, but the blooms won't arrive until next fall. So what happens often with the rodents is they see the foliage in the spring and then they eat the bulbs before they can bloom in the fall. And I hope that my little cage has helped eliminate that problem and that we do get some saffron to harvest next year. It's very picky to harvest because you have to pick out the little, little uh, small pieces from the center of the crocus. And that's one of the reasons it's expensive, uh, the people that do it. It uh, takes quite a bit of time, and they uh, charge for their labor. We can start uh, continuing to harvest herbs, start removing any of the annual herbs that have declined. Right now, uh, I have lemon verbena, pineapple sage, lemongrass, those are all annuals. The first frost, they'll be gone. So I either need to take cuttings, pick them and use them, preserve them, and let them go for the year once that frost comes. I also have some scented geraniums. I've taken cuttings of those to prolong their life. Hopefully, those cuttings will be brought in the house. The plants themselves will be dug after a frost. The other thing you need to can start doing now is picking up plant labels and putting them away if you do so. I like to put these away in the winter. They last a little longer that way. If I don't know where something is, I put in a, a label. 
and I'm going to label the saffron crocus so I know where that is next spring with just a little wooden tag and they'll know not to dig there and plant something else before it comes up. But we can take down the birdhouses and this one requires a uh, screwdriver to open it up and the side comes out. And I can empty out that birdhouse and put it away for the winter, putting it out about March next year. Some of the birdhouses are permanently installed. Those can be cleaned and left in place, but those that you can remove, you can take them in. And again, they'll last a lot longer if you're able to take them in for the winter. Now let's move over to the perennial garden and see what's blooming there. The perennial garden is on its way to fall, and actually fall is here. And you can start removing little uh, decorative items and storing those for the winter anytime. Uh, and some of the things are gone. This is a uh, salvia plant. The leaves are dry. There are no more blossoms on it. There are no seeds that I could leave for the birds. So I might as well just cut it to the ground. Maybe leave just a half inch or so of stalk so that I know there's something there. But these can be composted. Anything that has a problem, however, mildew or other problem, probably should not be composted. You uh, don't want to spread that problem. So instead, bag it and put it in the trash. These I will compost. Some of the others I will take down too. We have uh, Eupatorium chocolate that's in bloom right now uh, with its white blooms and it's uh, attracting a lot of pollinators. As is the Boltonia, which looks like an aster. Uh, and again, uh, these are alive with bees and flies and all sorts of pollinators and that's just what you want in your garden. The echinacea blossoms are going to seed. I'll leave the seeds on those so that the birds can enjoy them and they will enjoy them for quite a long time. The other reason to leave a few things in the garden over the winter is for the butterflies. We all think of the monarch that flies south for the winter, but most other moths and butterflies in New England don't fly south. They stay right here, usually as either a caterpillar curled up in stems or leaves in the garden, or sometimes as a chrysalis carefully hidden among the plants. Some, some of the chrysalises look just like a dead leaf, but they're there, and if you remove all of those stems, stalks, and leaves from your gardens too early, you're actually taking the butterfly larva or chrysalises or with it. So I will attempt to leave quite a few things standing this winter and remove them in the spring. One of the only things I will take down is the iris foliage, and that's mainly my convenience because I really don't like to work with it in the spring when it's all soggy and damp. So that will come down sometime in the fall, as well as daylily foliage. It too gets rather messy in the spring. But otherwise, I'll leave a number of these stalks right here in the garden. Some of them will supply some winter interest, like the grasses that I have in back. Others will just supply hiding places for those butterflies. Right now I have asters in bloom. And again, uh, if the camera comes in a bit closer, you will see just a whole, I don't know how many pollinators on this plant right now. Many, many honeybees, which is a really good sign. There were years when I had no honeybees at all in this garden which was very worrisome. They are back, uh, I hope partially because I'm not using any pesticides, but I suspect there are several people in the area that now have honeybee hives, and they travel quite a ways to get the pollen. So uh, anyway, I have lots of honeybees now that I didn't have before, and I'm very happy to have them. Also a nice uh, selection of bumblebees. Some of the annuals are still in bloom. I'll keep this pot here until it completely stops blooming and browns with the first frost, and then that too will be composted and put away for the winter. We're getting a last uh, bloom on some of the roses. 
This is a knockout rose and it still has quite a few buds. These just keep on going. Oh, but I won't be deadheading it much now. I'll just let the uh, it form. It will form not really showy uh, seeds, but it will give it the uh, information it needs to become more dormant for the winter and stop blooming. Grape hyacinths and poppies are putting up their foliage for fall. Uh, they put up foliage in the fall, but they don't bloom until spring. It's a completely normal thing. However, it seems like I have a rabbit or some deer that are uh, enjoying the foliage. They need that foliage to build strength in the bulb underneath, so I would like to keep some of it. So I'm going to use some deer spray on this. It's also good for rabbits, according to the package, which has been true. It just, you just have to remember to use it. So it's important to keep up with any spraying program you have for deer and rabbits because they are definitely in the area and they will enjoy your crops if you don't take some action to prevent them from getting in. Sedum Autumn Joy was pink when we did our last show. Now it's turning into a more deeper pink, almost red. It will continue to darken as the season wears on. Uh, it be, I will be left in the garden for the winter for the most part. Some of it I will pick to put in winter arrangements because the seed heads are very attractive throughout the winter. Moving over this way, I will take the poppy full or the peony foliage down. Uh, again, there are no seeds there for the birds, and I don't want to spread any mildew or other diseases, so that these will be taken down as they turn brown. I have more asters over here. Uh, this is the pineapple lily. This was its uh, flower shoot, which is now gone. It's still quite decorative, however, so I'll leave that standing for a while. As soon as we get a light frost, the foliage on this will go. It's a tropical plant, and they will come in for the winter. I'll just leave them in a cool bedroom. The foliage, if any is left, will brown off. I'll keep it uh, dry, and the bulbs that are in there will just be dormant for the winter. I'll bring them back out in the spring, give them a drink of water and a little sunshine, and hopefully we'll have more of the flowers next summer. The digiplexus I bought by accident. Uh, I thought I was getting something else and I ended up with digiplexus, which is a lovely plant. However, it is not hardy in this climate. I'm going to try taking it in for the winter. Uh, I have a pot already here so that I can dig it and put it in the pot. And we'll see if we can keep it alive for the winter. Sometimes this works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, it's always worth taking a chance. I like it enough that I'll probably buy another one next year if it doesn't work. These are the chrysanthemums that I divided two years ago and uh, planted probably five years ago. If you buy chrysanthemums now, don't count on them lasting into next year because they probably won't. It's very unusual when they do come back. Uh, if you buy your chrysanthemums in the spring, and usually that means buying them from mail order catalogs, you can get a lot of choice and you can grow them all summer and they'll bloom, but they will come back the next years. Uh, you just have to remember to deadhead them or they'll be this tall with sparse blooms. These we kept uh, picking the foliage off of throughout the season till about July 4th and then they started setting buds. And I have several of these throughout the garden. This one could probably be divided against next spring. So I'll make a note of that and see if we can get that one divided. We still have a little of the phlox blooming, uh, but it's pretty much on its way out. Again, I'll leave the seed heads there for a while and see if uh, the birds enjoy them. It's a good up time to plant new perennials if you are want, willing to take the commitment to water them well. I've uh, planted a small aster in the back and I need to remember if we don't get enough rain to keep it watered well 
or it will not take. The idea is to plant things in September or early October so that roots develop uh, nicely and the plant will be hardy enough to make it through a winter here. Now let's move on to the vegetable garden. I'm down here in the vegetable garden and it's uh, somewhere between lush and going to seed. Uh, some of the things, the, the nasturtiums have really taken off, uh, as has the uh, borage, which is an herb uh, much beloved by bees as well. And uh, we still have some lima beans, although the yellow beans and the green beans are gone and ready to be pulled. I've pulled the yellow beans from this site. We still have broccoli, kale, arugula, some uh, scallions that I planted from seed, uh, more a different type of kale, perpetual spinach, uh, and lettuce, and of course tomatoes and summer squash and peppers and eggplant. These are all things that can be picked as well as parsley and uh, other herbs from the garden and used in the kitchen and we will be using some of those things. Some of the best kale and broccoli and even cabbage comes after a slight frost. It seems to sweeten the plants and the broccoli will continue bearing sometimes even up until Thanksgiving. So I just leave that here and I do need to remember to spray it a little more often. I kind of fell down on that during my vacation and we had a lot of holes and you'll see cabbage butterflies are still flitting around so you have to continue with the spray until you don't see them anymore and then you can uh, let up on it. We still have a few butterflies in on the flowers. The flowers row that I planted has really uh, produced some nice blooms so we have some nice bouquets inside and the few butterflies that are left, the painted ladies and American ladies are enjoying them a great deal. I put a little marigold, a couple seeds at the end of each row. They've turned into large clumps of marigolds, which add a lot of fall color. But today, my task is going to be to do a soil test on the garden. It's good to do one every few years. You don't have to do it every year, but every few years, it's good to do a soil test. And if you go to the UMass Extension site on uh, the internet, you will get all the information you need to do a soil test of your lawn or garden. And this time I'm going to be doing my vegetable garden. I've done the herb garden a couple years ago and at some point I will do the lawns. They will tell you how to sample and they indicate that the sampling is the most important thing. If you don't have a good sample you won't get a good test. So the first thing to do is to rake away any mulch because you don't want that to be included. And then I'm going to dig down six to eight inches and you can use, if you had a soil auger you could use that, but I just want this top six to eight inches. And this spade seems to work pretty well for that. And I'm going to take a nice little core sample there. I'm going to repeat this same process in eight to ten other spots in this garden, varying spots. I won't go too near any more near the edge than this probably, but I want to get a nice representative sample throughout the garden. I'll put them all in my bucket and then I'll mix that soil well. At that point, after I've mixed it, I will take out a cup or a little more than a cup and spread it out on newspaper in my garden shed or a garage until the sample of soil is completely dry. At that point I'll put it in a plastic baggie, one cup, and send it in to Amherst to the soil testing station. Within a few weeks they will send me back a report on my soil acidity and whether I have enough phosphorus, potassium, and other trace elements. They will also let me know if there happens to be too much lead in my soil. If you are uh, gardening in an area that might have had an old factory or something like that, you might want to have these things checked because you don't necessarily know what was dumped in the soil 50 to 100 years ago. 
but they will do a full report on it and then they will also give me recommendations for what I can add to my soil to make it better. It's uh, again a good thing to do every once in a while. It takes a little time and effort but it is well worth it. Uh, it also costs I believe it's up to $15 now for a complete test, $10 to $15 uh, at your local extension. If you live in Rhode Island, or even if you don't, you can get it done in Rhode Island. But it's best to have it done nearer your home. I'm, I wouldn't want to send it to Michigan or Illinois because they are not familiar with the local soils that are available. So that's soil testing. And that's about all I need to do in the garden at this point, except start pulling up strawberries. I've decided that next year I need to plant new strawberries. So these will be pulled and discarded. And I need to find a spot that I can put in a new batch of strawberries next spring. I don't want to put them in the same place. So I'll probably move it over a little ways. I also want to find a spot to, harp, to plant my garlic next month and again, garlic was over here last year, so perhaps it will be over there next year. You want to alternate your crops as far as where they are from year to year. In a small garden, you really don't have a whole lot of choice to get it really far away, but you want to try to keep them in different spots. It kind of keeps some of the pests off guard and keeps you from having similar problems two years in a row. And also, your soil may be using your crop may be using certain things from the soil in one spot that they will get from the other spot in another year while the one where it was gets replenished. So let's move on to the shade garden. It's a hot day today and it's going to be nice to get in the shade for a little bit. I can't take all my plants inside. I wish I could, all of the annuals. Neither can I afford to buy all that I need next year or all that I want next year. And so I'm taking some cuttings and we did some cuttings a few weeks ago and I've continued taking cuttings and basically just taking growing tips of the plants, using a little rooting hormone powder and then sticking them into a rich soil mix. And you can use either potting soil or compost. I also took cuttings of some shrubs a few months ago and they were in my garden shed under a plastic bag and some of them have rooted quite nicely. Uh, a couple of the hydrangeas have formed small plants. Those plants will stay outside. I'll bury the pots in my garden and cover them with some straw mulch. The rest of the plants will come inside soon and go under lights for the winter and hopefully develop into nice little plants. You'll see I have sometimes two different plants in one pot. As, as these root, I will need to repot these singly so that each plant has its own little pot. The reason I put more than one, they don't all root. So occasionally you have some that don't make it and those will just be discarded. It's always good to take a chance on rooting something. You never know what might work and what might not and uh, you can always throw it away, but if it works, then you have another plant for next year. And many of my uh, larger planters use these as either filler or background plants in the planter. Over on this side, I've used from last year's cuttings, some ivy and uh, geraniums and a plectoranthus, which will be blooming soon. It will have blue blooms. So it's worth it to take a chance on it. Uh, this one I will be bringing inside for the winter and probably can plant it again. And it will probably be this tall next year when I get it inside and keep it in a pot all winter. They don't necessarily thrive inside in the winter, but if they stay alive, that's at least a head up for next year. Now let's move back into more shade. I think it's 10 degrees cooler down here in the shade garden and a nice place to work on a day like today. This is a plant called turtle head and it comes in pink or white. White is the native variety. Pink is a hybrid, but it is a native plant to this area, uh, to New England. And it's a nice plant. It's fun to watch the bees try to get into these uh, little hooded plants. They make it and uh, it's 
kind of interesting to watch. It's a fall bloomer and quite a pretty one and uh, it's very trouble free for the most part. It doesn't have many pests and the deer don't even seem to like it. So that's a plus and it is a fall bloomer. I have another one that's white over by the pond and that's where I'm headed right now. You'll notice some differences in the pond today. Uh, I have removed the plants that were in the water. Some of those will come in the house. Some of them, like the uh, canna lily, will be dug after a frost and saved for next year's planting. Others will come inside and live inside my sunroom for the winter. I've trimmed back the iris that is, was in there. And uh, we have a variety of frogs and other things in the pond, but I've put a net over the pond at this point. And I've tried to leave some spots for frogs to get in and out. I see a frog right now that is, I think he's out wanting to get in, so we'll let him work on his best. He's right over there. He's a little different. He's bright green and a good sized fellow. But there are some spots around the edge where the frogs can get in and out, and certainly they can get under the bridge or out through area, other areas. It's important to give them a way in and out because they like to go out and hunt during the day and come back at night. But the netting does keep the majority of the leaves out of the pond. I used an old sprinkler support uh, with adjustable legs. My pond has a shelf on one side, so the adjustable legs came in really handy. One leg is shorter than the other two. And this holds the net up so that the leaves will blow off instead of into the pond. The first year I did it, I just stretched it over the pond and I ended up with uh, a lot of soggy leaves laying on top of the net in the pond. So I decided it needed to be held up in some manner. And so that's what we did. Uh, held it up with the sprinkler and so far that's worked pretty well. The netting will come off. I've left my uh, pond mechanics in with the waterfall to keep the water somewhat clear and I can get in under the net to remove the leaves that collect in the skimmer that some will get in and any other debris that ends up in the skimmer. But I can use the blower to blow the leaves off the top and it really does help keep the pond clear for the winter. Uh, the ideal situation is to put your pond in the sun. Then you have to fight algae all summer if it's in the shade, you fight leaves and other things falling into it. So there's some maintenance if you have a pond, pretty much wherever you put it. And uh, I kind of enjoy having it out here in the shade. I'm gradually moving things into my shed for the winter. Any of the uh, plastic pots can be left outside. I usually put those in a large garbage can. But any ceramic or clay pots need to be taken in in the winter. And the reason is they will get water in them and the water will freeze and the pots will break. Even if they're upside down, the clay pots particularly will hold the moisture in the clay itself and they will crack if left out. So any of the clay pots will have to be emptied, washed, and brought into the shed for the winter. A shed, cellar, attic, wherever, garage, wherever, just to get them out of the weather and I'm working on that one gradually. Again, any plastic pots, I'm moving more to plastic pots for large pots because they're lighter for the most part and they can stay out. And uh, I usually like to keep them either nested or someplace in a sheltered spot. But uh, you do have to take care of them in the fall. Now, let's go up to the patio. I'm winding up on the plants on the patio that are going to go inside for the winter. This is a bougainvillea that I've had for about 30 years and it comes in and out. It gets a little harder every year and I probably will need to take a few things off of it to get it in the house again this year. Uh, it lives in the sunroom all winter and it will bloom now and then again next spring before I bring it back out. I love the blooms. They're kind of messy when they fall off. They're like crepe paper. I've always thought I should make a lay out of them and wear it and pretend I was in Hawaii in the middle of winter. Most of these plants are going to either come inside to the sunroom or they'll be going to my front entry where it's cool 
but doesn't go below freezing very often. If it goes below freezing, I need to bring the plants inside. Some of these came from the water garden. Others came from out in the flower garden that I want to keep. I've had uh, pretty good luck keeping the Gerber daisies over the winter to put back out next summer. So we'll try that again. And then I have rosemary, uh, tender lavender. I always bring in at least one coleus plant, which is over on this side. I'll peek through. And some of the others we'll try for a while inside. And then if they don't make it too much, they'll go into the compost. This is a house plant that I keep under my circular stairs to keep people from bumping their head. It has a plant with a purpose. And it gets a little too big, and then it uh, gets in the way. So what I'm gonna do is cut this one back, and I'll just cut some off of it. I brought it out when it rained last week so that it would uh, rain on it. And I'm just gonna cut it back. This one I think I'll go all the way back. And this one up to this point where there is some foliage, and again, this one all the way back. Just take the top off some of these. I'll be composting what I take off. Take off a little more on here. And then uh, adding some fresh compost or potting soil to the top of the plant to give it a little nutrition. I can see some roots coming up. The soil has kind of been depleted, so we'll add a little to that. Give it a nice drink of water and then uh, bring it back into the house in its normal position. It'll grow all winter and I'll probably repeat the same thing in a year before I bring it in. I prefer to repot plants in the spring before they go outside. Some of them always die, so there's no sense repotting a plant and then having it die and uh, wasting the effort. So I usually wait until spring to do any repotting, see what I have left that's looking good and ready to go outside. But some of them, like this one, really need to be cut back now before they come inside. So I'll do that. I have in another area that's a little more shady, some Christmas cactus that spent their winter out, or summer outside, and will spend their winter inside. They need, uh, they'll stay out until pending frost because they do need some periods of dark nights. And they're getting that being outside because there's no light where they are and they need the 12 hours of darkness. And now that the time we've passed the equinox, they're getting that time in the dark and this will help them put on their buds for fall bloom probably about Thanksgiving. Now let's go inside and cook up some of the things from the garden. Hi, we're in the kitchen to use some of the things that we have from outside. And today we're going to be making some snacks for a tailgate party. It is football season. We're at the end of September. Football season's going strong. So far the home team's winning. So let's keep it up and uh, have some good snacks for the people that come to watch the game. I'm going to start out with some uh, ground turkey or beef. I'm going to make uh, some taco cups. And I've already uh, pre-browned this earlier so that it wouldn't take as long. I'm using ground turkey and uh, you could use beef as well and then you would drain it of any fat which I've already done with this. I'm going to add to that about 10 ounces of tomatoes which I've peeled, seeded, and chopped. And one green chili, which I had in the garden. Uh, I grew a few chili peppers every year. I get a few chilies and uh, use them. If you don't uh, have tomatoes or chilies, you can always use a can of uh, the Rotel diced tomatoes with green chilies. That works just as well. But I thought since we had our produce from the garden, we'd use that. Also going to use three tablespoons of taco seasoning. Now this would be the equivalent of one of the packages that you can buy or you can make your own using chili powder, cumin, uh, and some oregano and that's what I did. 
So you can make it as hot and spicy as you wish. I also used a little coriander in that, which again, we grew. It's the uh, seeds of the cilantro. And we've made up this meat mixture. And it really doesn't require much further cooking. I just thought I'd heat it up a little bit to blend the ingredients. I've filled a muffin pan. I've sprayed the muffin pan well with the, the cooking spray. And then I'm putting a wonton wrapper in each of the uh, muffin plates. I'll make sure that's off. And then I'm going to add about a teaspoon of filling. Or a little more. Teaspoon, teaspoon and a half. He heaping spoon to each one. This one needs a little bit more. And I'm going to add a little cheese. This is just uh, shredded cheddar. And then we're going to start all over with the uh, taco shells and put another layer on, pushing it down as we go. Try to offset these a little bit so where the points were before or not where the points are this time around. I'll repeat the filling process. If you want to make this a vegetarian dish, you could use the, the spicy beans instead of the uh, turkey or beef for the filling. We have a little bit left, but we'll move that over. And then add cheese again. Rather than tacos, you could also uh, spice this, perhaps use sausage or spice it up as a pizza filling.
and use a mozzarella cheese instead of the cheddar that I'm putting on top. Now we're going to put these in a 375 oven and for 13 to 15 minutes. I'll set my timer. And we may need to add a little extra time, but it's always wise to set it for the slowest amount of time and hope that they're finished. And while they're cooking, we'll make another dish. And this is uh, a white bean dip. It's nice uh, for something like this to have a couple cold hors d'oeuvres and at least one hot one. And I'm using one can of cannellini beans which have been rinsed and drained. And uh, to that I'm going to be adding two good sized cloves of garlic. And I need to get some lemon juice from the refrigerator. We need the juice of half a lemon, and that would be about two tablespoons. And we're going to blend this. thoroughly chopped. And then add, while it's still running, a third of a cup of olive oil. to add some other items to this basic mixture and that would be a teaspoon of fresh thyme, about eight leaves of basil, a couple shakes of salt, a few grinds of pepper, and eight to 10 sun-dried tomatoes. Only these aren't sun-dried tomatoes. These are the roasted tomatoes that I roasted in oil in my oven. Uh, they were uh, slices of tomatoes and just roasted in the oven at about 250 degrees for about three hours. And I put olive oil on them and a little garlic and let them roast on a piece of foil. And then I uh, can put them in the freezer. And we're going to mix this into our dip until everything's chopped up and combined. And we'll add that to a bowl for serving. Add a couple of knives and we'll serve that one with uh, some crackers. And garnish it with a little of the extra basil just to give it a little color. I'm going to 
make another little cold hors d'oeuvre here. Wipe up my spills. I want to use some basil leaves, some of the cherry tomatoes, which are growing in abundance. I'm going to cut them in half. And I have some mozzarella cheese, and I will layer a tomato, a basil leaf, a piece of the cheese, and the other half of the tomato. If we can catch it on a toothpick. And I'm going to just make a few of these. This is a, a caprice salad on a stick. Do about a half dozen. Once you have everything out, they go pretty quickly. And I think I want a few more. As soon as the frost comes, the basil in the garden will be unfortunately gone. We've enjoyed it for a long season, but the time comes when a frost blackens it, which is always a sad day for me because I really like the fresh basil. Just isn't quite the same when you buy it in the supermarket. So the time is now to enjoy it. And if a frost is predicted, I will pick the rest of the basil and then make pesto, which will keep a little longer in the refrigerator or the freezer so that we'll have that to use during those times when we don't have access to the fresh garden basil. Okay, I think we'll stop at that point. And then to finish it off, I want to just slightly drizzle it with a little olive oil. Nice, robust, flavorful olive oil and a little balsamic vinegar. Oops, we got a little more than a little that time. Just a splash. That's all we need. And there we have yet another hors d'oeuvre. Now we need to make a dessert to go with all of this. And I'll move over to the other side and we'll check on our uh, little pastry cups, which look like they're doing pretty well. And reset the timer for a few more minutes. Basically all the ingredients in those was cooked. I have a pan that makes half Easter eggs for cupcakes. And I got it out and decided it would make awfully good footballs as well. So. If you have an Easter egg pan or can borrow one from the library's pan collection, I'm not sure if they have one or not, but uh, I've always had fun with it with the kids at Easter to make Easter egg cupcakes, but it also makes great footballs. So I also have some frosting. I've split each of these. You could also uh, cut them flat, but uh, they puff up and they make a nice little football shape. And so I've split these. And I'll put some frosting on them. If you have trouble with something like this, uh, splitting it and manipulating it, work with your cake that's cold. Uh, refrigerating or freezing cake sometimes makes all the difference in the world for how it handles. 
but I decided a, a filling would be good and this is a uh, mocha filling. Which will go in the middle. And you could use a mix to make the cupcakes as well. Clean up a little here. And then to finish them off so that they really do look like footballs, I put a little of the frosting into a uh, pastry bag and we'll make some laces on top of the footballs. Pretty easy to do. So there we have our little footballs for dessert. And I believe our uh, taco cups are just about finished. And they're looking pretty good. So our crunchy taco cups. Let's put some of those out on a plate. And we'll leave some of the rest in the muffin pan. And maybe a few garnishes on this if you're bringing it to the table would be nice. A little parsley. Maybe a few nasturtiums over here on the uh, dessert plate. These are edible flowers, the nasturtiums and uh, also the calendulas. Add a few of those. Put one of those in the dip too, just to give it a little bit of color. And we'll kind of move things together a little bit. And then we have some nice snacks for our football tailgating party. I'm Liz Davey, and you've been watching A Walk in the Garden on NCTV, Norfolk Community Cable Television.